Okay, so I guess it's just the three of us, but we're going to do this. Okay. So how are you guys doing today? Good, I'm doing well. Hello to the Philippines and hello to Jonathan as well. Thank you, Dan. So today's thing is employing, enabling technology to be deployed fully in rural regions. And um, so we'll go through that. Um, we can all go around. Everybody can just introduce yourselves. And then uh, let's get started. Edgar, let's start with you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I am from the Philippines. Uh, have been into agriculture, plantation agriculture, although I really have in my heart a deep passion for um, not the plantation type, but the smallholder agriculture because I live in the province. Um, we are into banana plant. We pack for um, major brands like Chiquita and Del Monte. Although I would suppose um, the uh, our Chiquita doesn't reach the U.S., we serve the Asian market, Japan also, and China of late. Um, technology to us is, uh, well, we know technology is more associated with uh, equipments and machineries and softwares. Uh, but from where I am, I also look at the... Uh, uh, not so talked about methodologies that's more oriented towards nature. And it's sad that the... Oh, by the way, should I go ahead go ahead already and say my points? Might as well. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, so the, the, the technologies, the large-scale application, that's really very important. If we have to feed the world sufficiently, if the warehouses have to be stuck. But then at the level of the villages, we cannot expect the small farmers or the poor people in the village to go to the supermarkets or to avail of uh, food that's in the supermarkets or in the coming from the warehouses. The food must be produced right at their backyard. Otherwise, there's be, there'll be hunger as there has been right there in the villages, the, the, the lands are not producing and the farmers are uh, crying to the government, crying to the world for help. So anyway, that's my take on our subject that uh, bringing technologies to the rural areas, that's very important. But the rural areas must also appreciate the technologies that are already there. It's, these are the nature provided technologies, free sunshine, rainfall, fertile soil which becomes infertile if we as a, as a small farmers keep on putting deadly toxic toxic chemicals into the soil so thank you that's for now thank you and daniel a little bit about yourself and hi well thank you john i'm in new york at home but as i show here here are all hats from the region I usually work in, which is Central Asia and the former Soviet Union, which are countries that end in STAN. Uh, and um, I actually will probably be going back to the region in a few months for a new project or new projects. And this, this, this uh, topic interests me greatly since the countries I work in, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, are very rural uh, societies, okay? And also I was involved, I was on the team that wrote the plan for what became the innovation ministry in Uzbekistan. And part of what we were trying to do was to bring uh, technologies to such areas to help solve societal problems. So I'll just give you my five minute uh, uh, talk here that I, that I uh, came up with. And uh, one of the things you know, that we're talking about in these rural areas, okay, as opposed to rural uh, urban areas. They have low population densities. They have skewed age cohorts. So you've got the young, the very young, and the very old. And if you look in the countries I work in, the villages are hollowed out. All the working age people are working in Russia and sending remittances back home so that these are some of the most remittance dependent, if not the most remittance dependent countries in the world. And the populations are spread out as well. And what you have there, you have uh, a few issues. Now, um, you have small rural towns, you have farmers' fields, 
And for instance, you have hospitals and schools as examples here. Now, the farmers' fields in the small rural towns in particular, these are exemplifying what, what's called the last mile problem, which is that you can bring the technology to some place, and maybe it's in a central place in a village, but how do you then get it to each home or to each each uh, um, business or whatever there? So that that's a, th those are big issues. And then you have the issues of power, connectivity, and operations. So before I get onto that, I want to say, for instance, broadband, something, something that yesterday was a luxury becomes now a necessity. We see that with broadband. We'll see that with data soon, I think. So when it comes to power, one of the things that we have here, um, big companies don't want to go to some of these rural areas. Okay, so maybe you can skip the big power plants and, 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 and as our friend from the Philippines was talking about, make use of the wind, the solar and the hydropower. Now, understand, too, I'm working in countries that are very Soviet and communist influenced and big projects were the order of the day. Huge dams. I mean, uh, huge. Well, and even uh, still today uh, with hydropower, uh, uh, Tajikistan, where I work, is trying to build one of the largest dams in the world and all that. But there has been a shift. The countries and the governments are starting to move into some of these renewable areas. I mean, for example, uh, part of these areas are desert, and they get 300-something days of sun a year. So, uh, and, and some are in the mountains. So Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan have as much potential hydropower, possibly, as anybody. Now you have connectivity. And, um, you know, one of the issues that we have is if we don't have good bandwidth and access is expensive, well, then how do we do IoT? How do we do Internet of Things, okay? How do we do smart grids if basic electricity is a problem? Uh, how, how do we do connected and autonomous vehicles if the roads are bad? But then the issue brings up the issue perhaps with leapfrogging due to online services, we can worry less about roads. For example, instead of building a college or a community college in a remote area and also needing the roads to get there, if you have good internet, you do your first years on, then you maybe go to the city college. So uh, there, are, there are those kind of things. But the thing I also want to mention is with the rise of teleworking, at least in developed countries, we're seeing a move, some move back to quote unquote villages and rural areas. And that's something I'm wondering if in developing countries, we may also see, uh, though the, 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 the starkness between the urban and the rural uh, technology access tends to be uh, quite a lot. Now, one of the very good things that we see about this technology is that it allows direct contacts between the buyer and the seller. So it allows for elimination of middlemen, say if a farmer is trying to sell their products. And I know we've seen a lot of that in Africa. Okay. Uh, one other issue I want to mention with that connectivity is, though, one thing to keep in mind, almost everybody uses a mobile phone. Even in the most rural parts of Central Asia, everybody has mobile phones. So it's all it's 90 something percent, but maybe only 50 percent use the Internet. So there's that difference that just because someone has mobile does not mean they're using the Internet and um, how to reach those people. And I'll get to that point in a second. I got about three or four minutes. Left. I'll talk about specifically about Kyrgyzstan and that issue. So now um, we have operations, the cost of installation. It's very high in rural areas. It's not affordable to set up everywhere. But something that's overlooked is maintenance and repair. So there's very high costs, especially if you need very nicely trained specialists to visit these remote sites. The technologies can be very expensive to support and maintain, even if the original equipment is free. Okay. And in these countries where I work, we tend to have a brain drain. As I mentioned, people leaving, working somewhere else, and a lack of specialists. So it can affect using whatever new technologies you want to talk about, drones, 3D printers, even, you know, maintaining water and irrigation uh, uh, ditches and stuff. Uh, two more points then. The law of unintended consequences. And I'm going to give you three examples. Okay. Oh, well, wait a second now. We also have an issue. Sorry. We got who invests and pays for the infrastructure, the government or the private sector. And, you know, if you're bringing certain infrastructure, does it favor large, well-connected farms, say, and then the small farms don't get the new infrastructure? And who puts in the, the algorithms if you're using AI and things like that? You know, rural people don't have much say in that. Now about the unintended consequences. 
Airbnb promotes tourism in rural places. Sounds great, right? But perhaps due to the high demand, the locals get priced out. They can't afford to live and rent anymore and all that. So you always have to be thinking uh, about that. Uh, then you have an issue. Remote health care. Sounds great. Yes, it is. But maybe it takes away from in-person visits. Maybe nobody is staffed to ever do in-person visits anymore. Uh, you know, driverless tractors. Sounds great. But problems of excess labor in rural areas. I remember visiting an aluminum plant uh, and, you know, the, 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 it wasn't in the main city. The technology was very obsolete. And the guy said, but listen, it provides jobs. If we bring in new technology, then there are no jobs. Then people are demonstrating on the streets. So we have these problems of unintended consequences that we've got to think of. And a lot of times when we put in new technology, we don't think of it. And we solve one problem and we create two more. Necessitating new technology, which solves one problem and creating the cycle just goes on and on. So the last two points, I think we need also to have these rural people involved in creating their own solutions, do-it-yourself solutions. They know what they need in a lot of cases. And as I mentioned before, one investment can lead to solving five or six problems. So for example, if you bring them good internet access, not only bring them internet, you not only bring them evading the middleman, you not only bring them maybe good education, but you don't have to build such good roads maybe because let's say, you know, you don't need to build the culture. They don't need to drive it. So you're saving some other areas. Now, the last point is about Kyrgyzstan and then I'll end it. I have a very good friend who works at the Kyrgyzstan Internet Society uh, and he has something called Ilim Box, I-L-I-M, which is, means knowledge and it's Internet in a Box and it's an online education platform. Okay, now what they're trying to do is to bring internet connectivity to remote villages. Kyrgyzstan is a very traditionally nomadic society. People move around in these rural areas. So they're trying to bring internet to these so-called jilos, which are valleys where people are moving. They're trying to bring relevant content, including in the local language. That's another issue. You know, is it just English or can we use local languages? and educational content, because people may not know Russian. They're not going to know English in these areas. Then there's a lack of digital skills and literacy. So they're training them on how they can use the resources. And also very important, unintended consequence, cybersecurity and personal data protection. These people, when they first get on the internet, they have digital innocence. They trust everybody. So they have to be trained about that. And he said that, you know, before, people there, these people didn't see why they needed the internet. But during the pandemic, they realized they needed it. Their children missed school. They, people got sick and couldn't get treatment. They lost economic opportunities. And he says the biggest issue in Kyrgyzstan, and it's probably in lots of places, is the policy and regulation issues there. So the new technology develops very fast, and the laws are not keeping up. And I suspect that's a problem everywhere in the world, developed and not developed. So those are my general points about bringing technology to to uh, rural uh, rural areas, at least from my experience in Central Asia and following other developments around the world. Thank you, guy. You made my life much easier. I stayed up two days taking all your notes. You just went through. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> he sent me all these notes. I was going to ask you questions. You just oh oh okay. Well, right. no, no, it's okay. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> I'll just say a little bit about me. Uh, sure. So my name is Jonathan Stone. Edgar and I have done this before. Daniel, you and I have talked on the phone. Um, yeah. My biggest thing was ending food insecurity, medicine, getting it to people, and found the biggest problem was lack of refrigeration. And so that's where we ended up creating fully off-grid, 40-foot refrigerators out of shipping containers. Um, fully insulated. They have satellites on them. They have internet on them. I can monitor with my phone, dashboard. Um, during the pandemic, the height of the pandemic, we recovered over 40 million pounds of food. Um, we took people that just came out of jail, a uh, place called like Father to Child and Second Chance, Second Choice, and gave them jobs, taught them how to work on solar, how to work in these containers. And all the nine people that we did that with now have full-time jobs they've joined different unions and things like that um one of the biggest things in rural areas and what we call them in more in the united states like food deserts um, and again there's no distribution points there's no hubs there's no 
a lot of food deserts out here in the United States, there's no grocery stores or anything. There's just liquor stores. Um, so what we've done is we put these refrigerated containers where I can have food dropped off bi-weekly, weekly, daily, and the local community will get fed. We can also store food. And one of the biggest things that we got were uh, a lot of people calling to use these for morgues, which I did not expect. You know, the height of the pandemic, I'm thinking about, you know, helping people with food and yet people want to use these for morgues. But technology has grown, which has been amazing for us in the sense we've now partnered up with Emerson, which is Copeland, who makes all the compressors for pretty much every refrigerator unit out there. Um, but one of our biggest problems now are supply chain issues, um, getting the compressors, getting stuff over from China all over the world, and the counterfeit products that are coming in. Mm. You know, so um, even Copeland now and Emerson is coming. But like, if I needed to build ten units tomorrow, I can't even get the parts for it. You know, which is, and it's a huge necessity. I mean, our systems alone, at greenhouse emissions, we cut it out ninety-five percent of greenhouse emissions. The reason that there's five percent is because food itself, is methane gas, and it turns it so it's like five percent. Um, but our biggest thing is, how do we keep food longer? How do we keep it fresh? How do we get it to more of these areas? How do we help people? How do we give pe teach people trades and stuff? Um, and it's really come together and working together and make a difference. And, you know, both of you guys know about this and we've talked about it. Um, it's just getting it to rural places and, and teaching people and showing people care. But one of the big things that I really focus on is when we go into these areas, not to just like set them up and walk away. You have to teach them. You have to share with them how to create a community, how to do this stuff. Because I found like a lot of times I'll go set up something somewhere. The minute I leave, give it a week or two, it's done. You know, they're just starting bicycles or something in there. You mm -hmm. have to educate people. Yes. You know, that's one of the biggest things because a lot of people, you know, you see this all around the world, missionaries going to places and doing stuff and trying to convert people and blah, blah, blah. Exactly. And then it's like, okay, we're done. We're off to the next place. These people don't know what they're doing, or they'll bring in all these, you know, to make shoes and to do this and give away free shoes. But now you're taking their, the local population out of business. You know, you're taking away jobs from local people, which is this. But I, I just, the most important thing to me is when you go into a community, rural community, to help people, teach them. Don't just set up something and walk away. Because I find that is that it's the biggest problem. We have, yeah. we have the same thing, uh, uh, the same issue I've seen, yes. And you bring this expensive stuff, and then when they leave, it's never used. And they come back yeah. two or three years later, and it's being used for something else. And I just wanted to make your example, you know, of the unintended consequence again, uh, Jonathan. Uh, we had a terrible winter 15 years ago in Central Asia. It was minus 30 in Tajikistan. There was no electricity, no water. It was something. And people came in and gave free food. But again, what happened is, is you put out uh, you put out a business, the people who are selling the food and making a living. So, you know, you have to analyze things systemically before you do all this kind of stuff. So I thought you brought up some very good points there that I've seen in my, in my uh, you know, work and what I do as well. Yeah, it's, it's really, to me, it's about elevating humanity as a whole. You can't just go there and solve the problems. You work with the community. You show them how to use this. You show them that it's possible. You know, that's one of my biggest things, is showing people that things are possible to do, like ending food insecurity. I mean, we have the blueprint. But then, you know, you're still dealing with politics and stuff like that because in rural areas, you know, they don't really vote. They don't make the money. People don't care as much. Right. You know, it's not the metropolitan area and stuff. So, Edgar, are those your roosters in the back? Sorry, my, <clears throat> my signal is fluctuated. What did you say? Uh, I said, are those your roosters in the background? <laughs> you hear my roosters. Uh, that's, the, that's the neighbor's rooster. Um. <laughs> there you go. Sorry I'm like, oh, no, no, it's okay because I know Daniel is in New York City, so I don't think he's got a rooster. No, oh, I have been in, uh, I went to my office manager's village in Tajikistan and certainly heard them uh, 
and some other things as well. It woke me up in the morning. It was actually nice. It's nice to hear nature sometimes. Right, right. Edgar, what I, time? Yeah, I hear you? sirens. There you go. Yeah. Edgar, what time is it where you are? Uh, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Oh, and, they're, and they're still going? Mm-hmm. Yeah, still. You know, um, listening to you and uh, Daniel also brings to mind the new uh, direction. I mean, actually, not actually new, but it's being revived. Uh, we're talking of, let's say, bridging the where food is coming from and to where you're going to bring it, whether it's through that, the refrigerated uh, facilities and the systems. But <clears throat> we are also trying to enable the cities uh, in the Philippine setting, but it's on other parts of the world. Um, it's called urban gardening, urban agriculture. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and the roosters you heard, actually I am I'm attending this meeting from Davao City. It's high, pretty nice. But the small houses here are engaging in what's called the container gardening, you know, with their empty right. bottles, yeah. discarded something. And uh, that rooster may be feeding on uh, one of those containers. Right. So, yeah, uh, I, I fully I fully agree to what Daniel said, really, and you also, uh, Jonathan. Uh, we just have to look at, we do not just barge, so-called barge into the village and right. tell them to do things or we do things the way we think is needed. It has to come from them and we just provide the support. Uh, separately, outside of this meeting, I'd really like to start uh, uh, conversing with you some more on how what I am doing here can benefit uh, my side of the world. Uh, Daniel, I was just telling Jonathan earlier that we're just recovering from the effect of that uh, typhoon last month. Uh, and interesting. yeah, when you talk about food deserts, for example, here we, <clears throat> it's a food desert that's not really in a desert. You know, these are fertile farmlands, but because of the typhoon, then everything is destroyed. So how do you deal with that? It's about maybe that helping them get back on their feet, on their farming, on their farming feet, you know put those uh, farms into production immediately. And that's where technologies that you you already have or have access to or have in mind, that's something that I would be very much interested in. Hmm. Well, we have, you, you have typhoons and in our region, we will have dust storms that come in from, hmm. from the south, from Afghanistan and like. Uh, and uh, can have droughts, drought. And for example, we have now uh, melting of the glaciers, uh, you know, lots of deforestation uh, and also um, melting of the glaciers early, increased flooding therefore, all kinds of things. And for example, in in our countries like Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, they're more than 90% mountainous, both of them, as far as I know. So the arable land is very, I think it's 7% of Tajikistan's land and so on. So one of the issues that I'm really concerned about in the future in the world, and certainly in the region I work in, is food security. Okay, I think that that's something that is very, very uh, important to be looked at, especially as the climate changes, and especially now, as you see with these supply chains, we had the global. I mean, this is more manufacturing, but agriculture too. You know, you can come to Tajikistan and see bananas imported from Ecuador or somewhere, or you know, I mean, that th- what's going to happen now that the globalization, which was deglobalization, which was starting before COVID and was giving a push, is now happening where you won't have a lot more of these supply chains and trade and all this and more localized solutions and things like that to the food. So the other thing, the other thing I I can mention, maybe this is of interest to you with food security, is that uh, um, uh, the Russian empire on the Tsars came in and took over Central Asia and then the Soviet Union took it over. During the Civil War, the American Civil War, the Russians couldn't get cotton from the U.S. South anymore. So they started to use Central Asia to grow cotton. But it was during the Soviets that they made what they called a cotton monoculture. 
So they took the farmers, okay, and they, um, instead of growing food and all this kind of stuff, they made them import food and everything was done to, to grow cotton, all kinds of irrigation. You may have seen the Aral Sea, which was the fifth largest inland body of water, uh, has dried up. Um, um, these countries are like the largest wastes of water in the world still. The sal salinity, the windstorms, and all this from this cotton monoculture and other societal issues. Uh, and so the cotton was sent out to be processed, so they didn't earn the, the, the highest value on it. And then they have to import food, which, you know, before they were growing all kinds of things. So they still have the um, impact of the cotton monoculture in these countries and the food security issue. And it's as there is in many areas, it's, it's only going to get worse, I think. So I think this is very much something that we have to look at, particularly for the rural areas, these agricultural areas. These countries being heavily rural in agriculture. You know, so, <clears throat> go ahead, Eric. Yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned about monoculture. Um, uh, reminds me of this very remote village in southern Philippines where we put up our close to 2,000 hectare banana plantation. So much tonnage of food, and it's banana is good food, actually. Yeah. Uh, but the irony is. The banana plantation employs only less than 5% of the people hmm. in that community. And for everyone that's who is employed, uh, there's 5 or 10 that's waiting or knocking on your door because they never experience what it is. Sometimes the effect of me, you know, uh, they envy the brother or the cousin, the uncle or the nephew who who's receiving cash every 15 days. While in their farming, they only like they have to wait for four months, and depending on the result yet. So you end up with that balance, as you indicated earlier. You know that unintended consequences. And since they do, they lose, they, they lost uh, the encouragement in their farming. They're just waiting by the gate of the administrative compound of the plantation. Mm -hmm waiting for them to be hired you know even on a temporary basis so they are direct distracted direct, directed out from their farms so we end up with people who are not engaged in productive activities anymore anyway just an uh, added insight into mm. what you said about monoculture edgar do you export a lot of your product the bananas yeah, uh, Cavendish bananas, as as we call them, these are the plantation bananas, are 100% for export. But depending again on the market uh, situation, sometimes they end up uh, not being sold anymore. They just end up in the local market or just discarded within the plantation. What about, what about shipping, though? Is ship, like shipping for me for, with solar food containers has gone up exponentially. I mean, it's... What I was paying a year ago to ship a container, it's two, three times the cost. Have you have you guys had to suffer with that or deal with that? Well, it, it's pretty straightforward because the the banana companies are also into the shipping itself. It's a separate cost or profit center. So right. even if farming is not so doing well, but the shipping shipping operation is assured of the income. It's a, the tonnage is there. So, yeah, but uh, on the subject of shipping also, um, uh, we spoke about uh, methane, uh, methane that's produced by this uh, uh, food production activities. There's been a question about why do we have to, uh, well, traditionally we ship fresh uh, products, whether it's uh, vegetable or fruits, but with the advent of food processing technology, uh, maybe we, we, we can look more it's being done but still at the initial stage but for example banana instead of shipping it fresh maybe we can ship frozen bananas but on the other end of the, of the that equation on the market side there's got to be a ready uh, process on what to do with it for example banana cake mm -hmm. you do not use fresh banana that comes all the way from across the ocean no. to be peeled and then uh, processed into to add to the flour Maybe frozen banana minus the peel, so it is it even uh, saved to the cost and uh, carbon footprint. So these are the sorts of things that can be done, and 
it's in the process of being looked into anyway. Uh, we have this uh, evacuees coming from Ukraine, for example, and uh, food is a uh, is a concern. Then we we do not talk about uh, fresh food, maybe frozen food, but that's really quality food. Yeah, I think frozen bananas would be great. I mean, I know here in the states, you have frozen stra- strawberries, all kind of berries, but I've never seen frozen bananas. So people mm. end up peeling them and then putting them in the freezer and then breaking them off. Because if you try to freeze it with the skin on it, it's not going to happen. You can't take the skin off. So we've learned in the States, peel the banana first, put them in the plastic bags and freeze them. But I think frozen bananas would be great. Yeah. We have dry we'll bananas. Converse. Yeah, we'll converse some more on that. There you go. No, I absolutely. I think it would be a huge market. You know, we have banana chips. But, I, yeah, I mean, I think, like, once again, I mean, what, why I love doing these things is meeting people that we can all work together to create change, to show people nothing is impossible. You. you know, that that's the most important thing. But we have to actually continue these conversations and do it. Right, yeah. You know? right. I mean, li- I, you know, life gets in the way, but, like, the, between all of us here, you know, we can figure out solutions, and that's the most important thing. And then activate them and make it happen, and people will follow. You know. Yes. I think it's, and people also need to have awareness of what's going on, there, what people need. You know, it's really hard. Like in the United States, one of my biggest thing is food insecurity, and there's like 16 million children that are hungry. There's 100 million diabetics and pre-diabetics in the United States. But if you talk to people about it, they go, "Go feed kids in Africa. Go do this." And you're like, "But this is your own backyard. This is your own community." What are we right. going to do to make a difference there? And it just blows me away because there's no awareness. And not only there's no awareness, people don't care to learn, to know. You know, it's like if it's over there, oh, well, that's a problem. I can understand it. What about your backyard? What about your own community? What about your future? You know, the future of the children, the future. Of the... It, it's it's very hard sometimes trying to explain that to people, to understand right. Um you know, we have to do it. Like one of the things I'll do, I'll get a major company, like say Interstate Batteries or something, which is like one of the biggest battery manufacturers. But I've taken them by their hand and showed them how to feed 4,000 children in an hour. And now they pay their employees four times a year to go out and do positive stuff, to bring in new projects. You know, so it's really important to show people, not just tell them we have a problem, but explain what the solution is then help them with that solution because there's 20 million people talking about the problems but nobody's right. coming up with solutions you know and that's why I love these kind of things and talking to you gentlemen it's about let's figure out a solution and then get people behind that may I yes may I also just suggest humbly that sometimes talking about a problem is a way to virtual signal, virtual signal to pretend and make people think you're actually doing something about a problem instead of actually doing it. I've seen that. I don't even want to mention all the times we see that. Sometimes people have honorable opinions when they're talking about a problem. They're just uh, uh, saying, oh, look, we're doing something about it and that's it. Yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, so that I, I agree with you 100%, uh, Jonathan. Yeah. Um, we have Michael joining us. He actually wants okay. to grab the mic for a second. Let's throw Mike. Wait a minute, it's, it's a very slow mic. Thing I know, I tried it. I was mortified earlier today. Like, yeah. Right. God, it takes forever. It takes a long time. Cool. All right, right Invite Michael on stage. I've done that. He said he wants to join. Oh, Michael's getting ready. It takes time. Yes, it does, yes. doesn't it? Well, it's, good to, it's good to have Michael with us. He's someone who loves yeah. problem solving. Yeah, yeah. We had a bunch earlier. Yeah. Okay. Am I doing it wrong? Probably not. He wants the mic. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure what's happening. Just give him another 
10 or 15. Yeah, I see Bubble yeah, going so, up with the mic on his face. Oh, okay. Maybe he's a floating <laughs> mic. <laughs> oh, there he is. Right. Sorry, guys. It's, uh, yes, it's something with the connection. Yes, Hi, I was... Uh, Yes, I was wondering if Mr. Bullitzer is using factoring when he's dealing with people who want to buy bananas in different countries. Sorry, something with the camera. Yeah, it's okay. I, I missed part of it, Michael. Can you repeat? Sorry. I... Yes, I, I just was wondering if you use factoring uh, when you're selling bananas to different countries. Use what? What factoring. is that? Factoring. Uh, factoring. factoring. You mean factoring? Uh, vacuuming. Yeah. No. No factoring. Are you saying vacuuming or factoring? Factoring. Factoring. A factory. Factoring. 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 What is? What is factoring? I may not be familiar with it. You yes, explain it's, it. it's a type of debtor finance when business sells its uh, receivable accounts to a third party, who is a factor oh, to discount. I no, we are not. I don't think so, but it's it's something that I would be interested to know more about. I see. I see. Yeah, please uh, t tell me more about it. Um, we will we, we will look into it. If that's something that can be good for the business. Yes, yeah, definitely. I think so. Yeah. Yes, Michael, I where are you? That. Where are you right now? Originally, I'm in Ukraine. The connection is generally good, but right now something is something just right. was happening. I don't know why. You are you in the Ukraine right now? Oh yes. No, uh, it's crazy out there. We're 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 praying for you guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, that's just. Uh, yeah, but at least you still have internet. Well, it's the good part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we still, still can talk and maintain the conversation. And smile. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, so we've been talking about how to help rural areas. And I build solar refrigerated containers. Um, that we acquired like over 40 million pounds. Of, we recovered like 40 million pounds of food last year. And redistribute out to people in need and stuff like that where there's no refrigeration. And, um so it's just, it's been a crazy couple of years. Yeah. Mm, I think the technology on storing food has also a long way to go. It's not all about insects. That is, <clears throat> that is a great source of protein. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, it's become big out here. They're using grasshoppers and stuff for proteins. Mm, I've heard about yeah. yeah. I think I even may know some people in Ukraine who are doing the similar thing or growing uh, both of fruits and insects at the same time. But these are rather just the individuals who are experimenting. Yeah. Right. So, Daniel, do you have anything that part of the world? Because that's your part of the world. Uh, yeah, insects in our part of the world, uh, there are certainly plenty of them, but we haven't gotten, I haven't heard anybody getting into that yet. <laughs> There's plenty of meat. We're big, in my part of the world, it's a very big uh, mutton and lamb and such uh, uh, type of uh, part of the world and rice. Uh, um, but uh, I, I suspect all these kinds of things are going to come into play because, as he said, the food security is, is only going to grow with, with all the processes of deglobalization and climate change and, and, uh, and, uh, and so on, decertification and deforestation and all these kinds of things uh, are, 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 all coming, are all coming up. So we're going to have to look at untraditional or non-traditional ways to to do things. Nice. I guess our time's yeah. up, huh? We just got an alert. All right, gentlemen, what else should we discuss? Or should I should I quit the live thing? 
just <clears throat> just very quickly on the subject of yeah. insects. Well, um, actually, Daniel, I would view insects to be the real traditional food. We just lost it mm. like decades back, but our ancestors uh, uh, fed on it. In the Bible, uh, the prophets were nourished by it, locusts. Um, and come to think of it, but not now because of too much chemical on the crops, but they should be very healthy to eat and safe to eat because they are organic. They feed on grass and leaves. And so, but again, not not with our generation because of the chemicals that are already on this on those leaves. Uh, but um, it is. I think there is a resurrection of that. You know? uh, every now and then we hear of, for example, fish ponds instead of being fed with. Uh, uh, pelletized mix of different ingredients. Others are GMO crops. Uh, there's a, a big feed company, I think, somewhere in Europe uh, that's looking for this kind of uh, ingredients. And they use the larva, but processed well, larva of what's called the BSF, black soldier fly. And there's all that merits there on why it is preferable. One fly can lay 1,000 eggs and uh, it's fast, fast growing. So anyway, we'll have more exciting discussions on it yeah. after this weekend. Yeah. All right. So I don't know if we're supposed to close it down now. And thank you to Michael, by the way, for joining yeah. in. Yes. Thank you, Michael. Need it's more been people. a pleasure. Yes. It's been a pleasure, gentlemen. All right, gentlemen. It was wonderful. We got to keep the conversations going, though. You know, Edgar, we've yeah. talked about this before and stuff. So everybody, have an amazing weekend. Thank you so much for your time. I'm looking forward to continue Great. everything. Thank you. You too. You right. too. Bye-bye. 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 Bye